been a late tonight. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Prayer to Christ the King. O Jesus Christ, I acknowledge Thee as universal King. All that has been made has been created for Thee. Exercise all Thy rights over me. I renew my baptismal vows, renouncing Satan, his pomps, and his works. And I promise to live as a good Christian. In particular, do I pledge myself to labor to the best of my ability for the triumph of the rights of God and of Thy Church. Divine Heart of Jesus, to Thee do I proffer my poor services, laboring that all hearts may acknowledge Thy sacred kingship, and that thus the reign of Thy peace be established throughout the whole universe. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. We are looking at Lesson 34, in the Passion of Our Lord. That is the fourth article of the Apostles' Creed. In the picture, we see our Lord, I guess, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, kneeling in prayer, we see an angel holding the cup there before him and the apostles asleep. And then, of course, in the far distance, I think we have Judas leading the, uh, I guess, the high priest, that, not, probably not the high priest, but the soldiers there to apprehend Jesus. And the caption says, After the Last Supper, Jesus went with his apostles to the Garden of Gethsemane, and going a little further, he fell upon his face, praying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me, yet not as I will, but as thou willest. After praying three times the same prayer, Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Behold, he who betrays me is at hand. Judas had come. What important events mark the end of our Lord's public life? The following events mark the end of our Lord's public life. His solemn entry into Jerusalem, the Last Supper, he ate with his apostles, and finally his passion and death. Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem in triumph, riding on an ass with children waving palms and singing. The Church commemorates the entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, on that day, palms are blessed, and there is a procession in memory of the palms that the joyous people waved at the entrance into Jerusalem of our Lord. Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter. The week following it is called Holy Week. On the Thursday evening after his entry into Jerusalem, Jesus ate the Paschal Supper with his apostles. We call it the Last Supper, for it was the last meal he ate before his death. The Jews celebrated the Feast of the Pasch in memory of their deliverance from Egypt. They had been saved by the blood of the Paschal Lamb. After the supper, our Lord washed the feet of the apostles. He did this to teach us humility. In memory, on Holy Thursday, the Pope washes the feet of twelve priests. In many countries, parish priests wash the feet of twelve poor men. After the washing of feet, our Lord instituted the Blessed Eucharist, said the first Holy Mass, and gave His Apostles their first Holy Communion. What is meant by the Redemption? By the Redemption is meant that Jesus Christ as Redeemer of the whole human race, offered His sufferings and death to God as a fitting sac sacrifice and satisfaction for the sins of men, and regained for them the right to be children of God and heirs of heaven. A Redeemer is one who pays in order to get back something lost. He gives satisfaction, compensation for an offense or injury done another. No creature could of himself make satisfaction for sin. Sin offends an infinite God and therefore would need infinite satisfaction. Therefore, someone infinite, Jesus Christ, had to offer that satisfaction. Jesus Christ suffered and died as man. As God, he could neither suffer nor die. He suffered excruciatingly in order to make full reparation for sin and to impress on us the great evil of sin. Even only one sin is so abominable to God that not all the del deluges delusion, yeah, we'll skip that one, and fires can wipe off the stain. Only the blood of God himself can do so. 
The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ died for all men without exception. He is the Redeemer of all men. Not all men are saved, because not all accept the graces which Christ merited for us by his death. Many do not believe in him. Of those who believe, many lead sinful lives. Christ also loved us and delivered himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. We can never realize fully that God died for us. We can never repay him in this life or the next. The only way we can show our appreciation is to live according to his will. Okay, so, uh, many people confuse uh, redemption and salvation um, and think that because Christ died for all of us that we all get to go to heaven, um, that he's already paid the price for all of our sins. Well, that's what his redemption is, but uh, we have a saying in the church that um, Christ redeemed us without our cooperation, but he will not save us without our cooperation. Um, so we have to understand or to see that distinction between redemption and salvation. They are not equal. They're not the same thing. What were the chief sufferings of Christ? The chief sufferings of Christ were his bitter agony of soul, his bloody sweat, his cruel scourging, his crowning with thorns, his crucifixion, and his death on the cross. Christ had often foretold his passion, for he was teaching his disciples and saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and having been killed, he will rise again on the third day. Again, behold, we going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, and spit upon him, and scourge him, and put him to death. And on the third day he will rise again. From the Last Supper Christ went with his apostles to the Garden of Olives to pray. There he was overwhelmed with sorrow and agony, so that he sweated blood. Our Lord looked forward to his agony, saying to his apostles, that the world may know that I love the Father, and that I do as the Father has commanded me. Arise, let us go from here. In the garden Jesus felt so sad at the sins of men and at what would befall him, that he said, My soul is sad, even unto death. To his Father he cried out in pain, Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but thine be done. In agony his sweat became as drops of blood, running down upon the ground. Jesus was, pre was betrayed by Judas, seized by soldiers, led before the high priest, and condemned to death. The Sanhedrin, the council of the Jews, headed by Caiaphas, the high priest, condemned Jesus to death for the crime of blasphemy, because he claimed to be Christ, the Son of God. Then the high priest standing up said to him, Dost thou make no answer to the things that these men prefer against thee? But Jesus kept silence. And the high priest said to him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, Thou hast said it. And the high priest tore his garments, saying, He has blasphemed. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, He is liable to death. Jesus Christ was led to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, to have his sentence confirmed. At the time, the Jews were forbidden by their Roman masters from putting anyone to death without the confirmation of the governor. Pilate questioned Christ time and again, but had to say to his accusers, I find no guilt in him. The Jewish priests and Pharisees hated and persecuted Jesus because they expected the Messiah to be an earthly king. They were so wicked that in spite of the proofs of Christ's divinity, they would not believe a poor man could be the Messiah. They hated Jesus. He had rebuked them for their sins. 
But Pilate wished to please the Jews, and had Jesus scourged. Jesus was bound to a pillar, his clothes torn off, strong men with whips, cords, and straps with iron spikes scourged him, and the whole body of our Lord was one great wound. And the soldiers, plaiting a crown of thorns, put it upon his head, and arrayed him in a purple cloak, and they kept coming to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him. Pilate therefore again went outside and said to them, Behold, I bring him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus therefore came forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and he said to them, Behold the man. At last, fearing that if he did not permit Jesus to be put to death, the Jews would accuse him before Caesar, Pilate gave in to the insistence of the Jews and delivered him to them to be crucified. Christ was made to carry his cross through the streets of Jerusalem to Mount Calvary. He was nailed to the cross about noon, dying three hours afterwards, crucified between two thieves. Any questions? I think it's pretty much hammered into almost every Catholic. I think we pretty much know the passion of our Lord. Um, even though the Protestants might find it abhorrent, uh, they don't like the crucifix. They would rather have a cross, nice, clean, and sanitary. Uh, but the Church insists that uh, the image of Christ hanging upon the cross should be there before our minds, before our eyes, throughout our life, throughout our uh, day here on earth, uh, so that we will recall the sacrifice that Christ has made and the evilness of sin that is required the sacrifice of Christ, uh, but also manifest the love of God for us, that God so loved us that he sacrificed himself on the cross for our sins. Um, I did was kind of anticipating that they would mention that no one took the life of Christ, but as he said, he freely uh, laid down his own life, and he freely took it up again. Um, and I think that is important for us to remember that uh, no one had any real power over Christ except those to whom he gave it, those to whom he allowed uh, this to them to do this to him. Uh, but it, on the same token, he does not force us into heaven either. We are free to sin, we are free to offend God, uh, but in doing so, we bar ourselves, I think, from eternal life. Uh, we make it difficult for ourselves. Uh, we don't really harm Christ in any way. He is now alive in heaven. Um, our actions, I guess they might have uh, spiritual ramifications. He does not want to see us uh, lost or to see us damned, and he did weep for us. He thought of each one of us specifically uh, as he hung upon the cross and died for our sins. Uh, but he loves us enough to let us have our own will and to do our own thing and to uh, spend eternity without him if we don't want to be with him. And I quite often try to emphasize that God doesn't, he's not a vengeful God sending us to hell and punishing us for every single transgression, but rather it is simply a sign of his love for us that he openly says, if you don't love me, you don't want to be with me, then you will spend eternity away from me. Um, I love you enough, I've given you a free will, and this is your choice, you will exercise that choice for all of eternity now, just as the fallen angels had done. Okay. And I guess nothing else to say. We can end with the act of resignation to the divine will. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Lord my God, I now at this moment readily and willingly accept at thy hand whatever kind of death it may please thee to send me with all its pains, penalties, and sorrows. Benedictio de omnipotentis, patris et filii, 
et Spiritus Sancti, descendit super vos, et maniat semper. Amen.